Welcome back. You're watching HFO TV. Hi, welcome back to HFO TV. I'm Greg Frick with HFO Investment Real Estate. Today we have JP Vallette, founder and chief of SiteWorks Design and Build. Thank you for coming today. Yeah, thank you. Maybe you can give us a little background on SiteWorks. I know we've you know known each other for years, but maybe give the audience a little idea of kind of your background and how it relates in the multifamily world. Well, I'm a native Portlander, first of all. Um, started SiteWorks about 23 years ago, um, understanding that there would be a lot of efficiency and less friction in the process by com combining architectural and construction right. into one office. So a build, uh, design and build shop. Yeah, okay. all in one shop. So, you know, my project managers and my architects are together every day in the conversation of the project. Okay. So we get a lot of efficiency out of that. It also allows us to, you know, take care of major milestones of the project in the design phase without addressing, you know, the final pieces like paint color. Right. What are you seeing changes in that the last couple years in terms of apartment construction, either on the design side or the build side, since you've got experience on both? Well, you know, it continues to change. I mean, this is a moving target. Right. Um, you know, what we were doing in 2008 was small one-bedroom apartments, energy efficient, and um, no parking. Now we're putting in a lot more parking. <laughs> we're uh, looking at three-bedroom units. We're, um, you know, we're doing a lot of different things. The energy costs have gone way down. That's really, you know, hurt the ability to be uh, efficient and as, as green as possible. A lot of the incentives have dried up. Um, but, you know, we're still seeing good returns. We're still seeing good job growth. We're still seeing right. low vacancies. So um, we are able to use really, you know, high quality materials as a result, for, result of that. And is it changing in materials? Have you gone more, I mean, uh, more green in terms of material? Just I know energy costs are down, and like you said, the incentives aren't there. But I've, yeah. from what I've seen just in the construction style, it's gone more to a sustainable kind of model moving forward. Well, you know, it just seems like materials keep getting smarter. I yeah. mean, so we have siding materials that absorb absolutely zero, you know, moisture. We have, you know, um, you know uh, ventilation systems that ventilate all the hot air behind the systems. There's more and more... Uh, rain screen technology is more commonplace. The uh, window manufacturers are prepared for that. So you're getting a lot better building, you know. And right. when you talk to older developers, they're like, oh, no skylights and things like that. But, you know, now we have technology and waterproofing and uh, envelope technology that just surpasses yeah, anything. Than it was, you know, five years, even five years ago. Even five years ago, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What are some of the challenges you see? I know in this market we hear a lot of challenges on the, on the build side is, you know, finding uh, finding subs when we're in this kind of this building boom, finding quality subs to come in and, you know, complete the work. Are you seeing that as well and what that does to the cost of construction? Yeah, I mean, costs are definitely increasing um, as, as far as the labor goes. I mean, again, we're seeing efficiencies in material right. costs. But, uh, yeah, I mean, having been at this for 23 years, it's time that I'm cashing in my relationships, yeah. you know, right, left, and center. Um, you know, we run a really good organization. People know when they're supposed to be there. They know when they're going to get paid. Right. You know, um, this isn't, you know, fast, cheap, and out of control. And that goes a long way. If, you, if you've got a lot of options yeah, as a subcontractor, you're going to choose working with an organization that you can really trust. Right, right. So what are we doing as a, you know, a community in the supply side? Just simple economics. We don't, you know, get more units in place with the amount of immigration. We're going to have a, you know, demand supply, you know, inequality, which then drives up pricing. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, um, I really think we need to discuss what is the affordability. Who is the affordability right. for? You right. know, I mean, I really uh, want to make a big point for, you know, the teachers, the social workers, the chefs, the people that are really the fabric and the what is, you know, the drive to Portland. Why people are migrating here. Um, and, you know, making, we really need to invest in those local businesses. We need to invest in those local people. Um, you know, maybe we're building blocks for teachers. Maybe we're building blocks for different kinds of um, businesses. If we could do that, that'd be amazing. I know it's been done in other countries. Um, and I also really like the, um, the prefabricated, you know, modular unit stuff that right. I've seen. So, I mean, I think that's really valuable. If we can get that to be quickly permitted, pre-approved, um, and in place, and you know what I what I really like and what I really specialize is, you know, urban infill. Yes. So you know, I mean, smaller pieces, um, creating opportunities in school districts, giving you know the future children a chance to break the cycles of poverty, 
um, things that can go up fast and be durable, made of you know worthy materials, right. built in controlled environments. That's what I really like to see in that in that conversation. And I haven't heard much about that. You know, I haven't heard those sorts of solutions. I think affordability is incredibly important across the board. You know, I mean, uh, you follow the. Uh, I guess the Starbucks model, even though you know they raised a cup of coffee from twenty-five cents to four dollars, <laughs> it's still a, an affordable luxury. You, it's you know you take a, something that can really benefit a larger community, and you make it extremely available. Right. You know, it, you know a lot of these good ideas get so um, focused that they don't expand or they, and they don't really create a cost efficiency and don't address enough people. Right. You're not getting enough momentum. You're not getting enough people involved. Enough people. And now you said not enough people on the benefit side. So there's no right. way to kind of replicate them and moving forward. Yeah. We need replicable ideas. You know, I mean, our eco flats model is very replicable, you know, using 50 by 100 right. um, footprints. I mean, there's a lot of those available, right? right? So you can replicate some of these things over and over again. You can still change the exterior design. But you know you've you've designed the mechanics and the function of the of the building, you know. Um, however, you know that said, the market keeps shifting too. Yep. So what we design today lands three years from now. So um, we have to be predicting that um, you know we're probably going to have a lot more families and apartments. We're going to need more three bedroom apartments. Yep. That wouldn't have been something you did in 2008, 2009. Well, it wasn't something done, that, you know, in the apartment side. We just don't see it anywhere. I mean, right. we just see a, you know, lack of, you know, anything above it. You know, back in the 80s and 90s, it was all two bedroom, two bath, suburban garden style. Now we're not seeing any three bedrooms anywhere. We're not seeing many two bedrooms even downtown. And like I said, that's been a big question. You have the infill coming in. You have people getting here. Are you really, like you said, it's the key in kind of designing. You're not designing for today. You're designing for three, four, five years out. And, you mm -hmm. know, where do we think that's going to change? And yeah, you know. I, I have a strong feeling with the you know the infrastructure, the transit systems getting more robust. That you know people are just going to want to be below 39th if they're on the east side, up yeah. and down the river, and I think you're going to see families um, moving into apartments. I mean, it's what you see in any major urban environment, right? Right. I mean, it's not like we're inventing the urban environment. We just need to kind of understand where we are in the timeline of this uh, yes. migration. I mean, we set Portland. One thing I always say to people: Portland set some very good things in place at the beginning. Um, and now you see the fruits of that, and it, we're you know successful. We're becoming a major city, yeah. but it's almost sometimes you get a feeling like we're surprised it was successful, yeah. and now we're wondering how do we deal with the success. So it's uh, right. yes, it's a very interesting way to look at it. Well, yeah, it's it's funny, you know. I mean, having grown up in Portland, um, the the only way we were really recognized worldwide when I would travel was Tanya Harding yes. taking a crack at Nancy Kerrigan. That was yeah. our most famous moment. So then. Yeah. The fact that our popularity followed that moment is, yeah. you know, is very surprising. Um, I remember when kids would move here from California, they would, you know, come into the classroom and they'd just be crying for weeks, you know, <laughs> but they were now in Oregon. Um, and most people just think it goes California, Canada anyways, they don't even know we exist. So it's a, it's a, in this one lifetime I've had, it's been amazing to see how we've completely turned around. And I get why it's popular. I mean, it's oh, yeah. the urban growth boundary, the access to the ocean and the mountains and, and the beautiful summers that we have, so. No, you can see why it's a destination. And that's what I yeah. say on the, you know, on the cycle that we're in now, in the development cycle, you know, we've, we seem like we've gone longer than typical. And you say, well, yeah, but look at the immigration numbers. I don't think, if you would ask anybody 10 years ago, we knew we were popular. We didn't know we were this popular, and you know, and you see it coming, and you know, yeah. we just have to kind of deal. It's, it's going to change. It's going to change how you have to look at things, and like you said, get more creative in solutions. Yeah. And I, I think we're running our own economy. Um, you know, I was a, I, I did an, a, my first uh, apartment building in 2008 when everybody right. was getting bailed out of right. their condo situation. I saw, you know, hey, if everybody's doing condos, I'm going to do apartments. Uh, it turned out to be a good move. Um, and, and I'll tell you, one of the key th indicators for me was talking to, to some of the major sportswear owners. We do a fair amount of work for sportswear. Which is talking big in this area. Yeah. And, you know, hey, why did you move Keene up from the Bay Area? Well, because you know, we can get employees for sixty to $100,000 a year rather than hundred dollars to $250,000 a year. We still represent that, you know, right. uh, in, as Portland. We are in a deep valley between Seattle and in uh, San Francisco and the affordability Oh, model. definitely. So e even with the higher cost of living, the higher cost of construction, the higher cost of, of new apartments, those are the ones with the lowest vacancy. Yes. Because those jobs are being created here. As long as this job growth continues, and in Portland, it's uh, again, it's so much cheaper than San Francisco and, yes. and Seattle for 
those business owners, I don't see what would prevent that from continuing. I agree with you on that. I mean, the other thing too, even not even on a cheap, just on like you said, the livability, the proximity to the ocean, proximity to the mountains, and the outdoor lifestyle. Yeah. It's just all those things are kind of you know in the, in the, the nice summers, mild summers. We don't have humidity, right. driving all this immigration. And you know, like I said, as we continue to get jobs, right. we're still going to have not issues, but concern. How do you deal with you know the immigration of people, and where do you put them up to live? And that's where I think, you know, as a, as a city we need to kind of look at maybe outside the box as to what's worked in other countries, what's worked in other cities, and really look at that as opposed to just kind of the old school way this is how we'll address it. Yeah, I mean, and we have done gr a great job with urban planning. Yes. I mean, it's from Tom McCall forward, I, I think we've done an, a fantastic job. A lot of it is education. I mean, you have people also that are moving into this community that, you know, ha maybe they migrated out of San Francisco. and it hit five bucks a square foot there. You know, I mean, we're, it just got too expensive for them to live. So they're, they're, they're seeing what's happening here. They don't know what's in place. They're not understanding how this plan works. You know? Right. Whereas like, you know, sometimes we'll get a complaint for removing a single family home on a major transit corridor. And uh, one complaint I got was that it was uh, gonna cause air pollution. Well, the old guy that stood up at the neighborhood meeting before me, was saying we've got to get our ridership up on, Tran on TriMet or we're going to lose the bus stop. And we're putting 50 units where there was one Once, house. Right. So, you know, we need to understand that's really good to, to, to stop the sprawl. We yeah. love the urban growth boundary. We want to protect the access to the ocean and to the mountains. We want more use of the transit system. We want to be building on those major corridors. Some single family homes are going to come down and that's going to benefit everybody. But right. that's a system that's in place. And I don't know how many people really understand that we have that strong program. It's an, it's an education process, I think. I think yeah. that's, a, that's, like you said, it's a big education process. And, you know, right. partly, it's, you know, it's a thing of people get here and, you know, I want density, but I don't want density in my backyard, which is I understandable. Right. But, you know, why did you come here is the same reason why the four people behind you want to come here. Right. Just right. because you got here first right. doesn't necessarily mean you can lock it out. So I think there's a little bit right. of that that needs to take place. So. Right, right. The classic Portland is the single family home with a garden in front across from their favorite restaurant and yes. don't park in front of my house. Right? Yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, thank you for coming. That was very enlightening and uh, we'll see you next time on HFO TV. Thank okay, you. All right, thank you. Our entire office specializes in multifamily real estate, making HFO the largest multifamily brokerage in the Pacific Northwest. Your success is our passion. Build your legacy with HFO. Call 503-241-5541 or visit our website at hfore.com for more information.